Thank you for joining us today. The following presentation is from a webinar titled Skimming What the Auditors Miss, originally produced on March 21st, 2013. The presenters are Jim Schellenberger and David Hammerberg with McConley and Asbury. Enjoy the presentation and visit us online at www.macpas.com for future events and webinars. Hello and welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Jim Schellenberger. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about fraud in a financial statement audit. Uh, before I get into that presentation, I'd just like to take a minute and tell you a little, little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a senior manager here at McConley & Asbury and I've been here since 2002. It seems like a long time. I am uh, a member of our audit department and work 100% on external financial statement audits. So my perspective is going to be a little bit different from Dave's, uh, and Dave will take a couple minutes here to introduce himself. My focus here at McConley & Asbury is on a lot of different industries, including manufacturing, construction, not-for-profit, and I also do a lot of work in the real estate housing partnership uh, industry as well. So here's, a, here's Dave. He'll tell, him, tell himself a little bit about uh, what he does here at the firm. Thanks, Jim. As Jim said, my name is Dave Hammerberg. My role at McConley & Asbury is slightly different than Jim's. It's a little bit more diverse. I'm a senior manager in the consulting department as well as an IT director for the firm. I'm a CPA and a CFE and hold various IT and accounting related certifications. In particular for this webinar, the CFE uh, is important, certified fraud examiner. I've been conducting fraud investigations for over 12 years now. Before we get into today's presentation, I'd like to take a minute and just tell you a little bit about McConley and Asbury, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with us. Uh, and if you're not familiar with us, please visit our website at www.macpas.com to learn even more. But essentially, we are a regional accounting firm with a large practice in audit, tax, and risk management. Uh, we've been around for 40 years, and in fact, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. We work with a wide range of clients in many, many different industries, including some of those that are very uh, prominent here in the central Pennsylvania region and really throughout the entire country, being manufacturing, construction, not-for-profit, uh, insurance, and a number of other industries as well. Uh, we do a lot of fraud and forensic work, and that's obviously why we're here today to, to talk about that, and also work in areas of risk management such as internal control and uh, internal audit outsourcing. We've been fortunate enough to be recognized as the best places to work in Pennsylvania numerous times over the past decade, as well as a best accounting firm to work for in the United States of America. So something we're very, very proud of, um, and we're welcome again to our webinar. Okay, it's Jim again, and we're going to talk about fraud in the financial statement audit. Uh, a little bit of different perspective from what Dave's going to be talking about in a few minutes, but I'd like to take, us, take some time and talk about what it is your external auditors do with respect to fraud during a financial statement audit. So what is a financial statement audit? A financial statement audit is an audit of financial statements and disclosures. Typically, that includes a balance sheet, statement of income, statement of stockholders' equity, statement of cash flows, and the very, very important part of a financial statement called the disclosures. When I perform a financial statement audit, I'm performing that audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Those standards are issued by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and is the law of the land when it comes to performing a financial statement audit. One of those laws is the Statement on Auditing Standards Number 99. Statement of uh, Auditing Standards 99, or SAS 99, was issued back in 2002 and is the quote-unquote Bible for, for considering fraud in a financial statement audit. Uh, it became effective back in 2002. Uh, actually, for most of you, uh, you have experienced this on your 2003 financial statements. And it was really a result of the Enron, WorldCom uh, scandals back in the early 2000s in the beginning of a change in the shift of accounting and auditing to more risk assessment, fraud-focused auditing. Um, and I'll talk about in a few minutes, the goal of an audit is not to discover fraud, uncover fraud, uh, but it's something that's very important and has to be considered as part of a financial statement audit. During a financial statement audit, there are, there are two 
two levels of responsibility that I want to talk about, and that's the auditor's responsibility with fraud and also management's responsibility with fraud. And, and first, I want to talk about the auditor's responsibility, and not necessarily just about fraud, but in general. And during a financial statement audit, uh, the auditor's responsibility is to plan and perform the financial statement audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatements. Now, I've underlined two words on this slide, reasonable and material. A financial statement audit is not an end-all, be-all, though it does provide a very high level of assurance. Reasonable is meant to be a very high level of assurance. It's not absolute, but it's very high. And material misstatement doesn't mean we're going to catch or uncover every little thing that occurs during a financial statement audit or during your during the company's year, but we're going to plan and perform our procedures to detect material misstatements. Now, those material misstatements are caused by three three different categories, if you will: errors, fraud, and non-compliance. Errors are unintentional misstatements. Those are things that uh, somebody or an organization might just mess up. Fraud is an intentional misstatement or omission of a fact. And non-compliance with laws and regulations, that it's kind of a broad category. Uh, but again, the focus of non-compliance with laws would be those that would have a material effect on the financial statements. When performing the audit, the auditor uses what's called professional judgment. Professional judgment is up to uh, the, the determination of the auditing firm and the auditing team as to what levels of procedures are going to be performed on an audit. Um, all this being said, there's a lot of subjectivity to an audit, uh, but the main responsibilities are to ensure that there's reasonable assurance that, there's n that the statements themselves, including disclosures, are free of material misstatement. Management responsibility is the other aspect that I'd like to take a second to talk about. Now, I've included directly from a standard independent auditor's report the language that uh, is relevant to management's responsibility, and you'll see uh, the word fraud in this. And this actually appears right in our audit opinion. At the end of the day, management of the entity and those charged with governance, those charged with governance could mean the board of directors, could be a general partner, have the primary responsibility for the prevention and detection of fraud. You cannot rely on your external financial statement auditors to be your fraud controls. Very, very important point. Management is responsible. So you're probably wondering what the definition of fraud is relative to a financial statement audit. Well, I've included the definition here on the slide for yourself. The, the definition of fraud is an intentional act by one or more individuals among management, those charged with governance, employees, or third parties. So again, it can involve many people. It can involve one or, if not all of these people, involving use of deception that results in a misstatement of financial statements that are subject to an audit. Now, the audit standards explicitly recognize that some, mis some misstatements might not be detected in an audit. And that's basically due to the inherent uh, limitations of an audit. During an audit, I had talked about earlier, we do not audit every transaction and we do not audit for immaterial amounts. We audit for reasonable assurance and we audit for material misstatements. So there is a risk that fraud may occur and may not be detected by our procedures. And you think about that, you know, fraud usually involves sophisticated schemes, carefully organized ways to conceal deliberate deliberately misstate amounts, hide documents. So as you step back and you think about that, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Another important characteristic of a financial statement fraud, uh, financial statement fraud as it's included in the audit, is that the auditor is not making the legal determination of whether a fraud actually occurred. Um, that's something that's outside the realm of a financial statement audit and is not part of what a external financial statement auditor does. So when I work with my clients on their financial statement audits, I discuss fraud and I def define fraud into two categories, uh, those being fraudulent financial reporting and misappropriation of assets. Fraudulent financial reporting is the intentional misstatement, including omissions of amounts or disclosures in the financial statements. So when I think about fraudulent financial reporting, the phrase cooking the books comes to mind. It's, it's the deliberate intent to misstate the amounts that are on your balance sheet or income statement or in the disclosures to the notes. There's some type of intent to deceive the user of the financial statements, uh, and it often involves not only making those inaccurate journal entries, but also manipulation of the accounting records that support those journal entries. 
Um, it, it can involve misrepresentations by senior members of management or employees regarding whether or not an event or transaction actually inspired. And ultimately, the biggest risk is around management override of controls. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in my presentation. The second type of fraud is misappropriation of assets. And that, that involves the theft of companies' assets, uh, stealing, uh, whether it's money or physical assets. Um, <clears throat> it could also be the stealing of intellectual property. And while that is very uh, relevant in today's society, I'm not going to touch on that much in my, my presentation. Things like embezzling receipts, taking cash that's, not, um, that's a company asset and not a personal asset. Um, using assets for personal use is another common fraud that falls in the category of misappropriation of assets. So before I get into some of the requirements of consideration of fraud, I kind of want to recap with what are the auditor's fraud objectives during the audit. And it really boils down to three items. We identify and assess the risk of material misstatement of the financial statements due to fraud. And we do that through a variety of different procedures and audit techniques in order to come up with these assessed risk of material misstatements. The second objective is we have to design the appropriate response to these risks, whether that means additional procedures, additional inquiries, um, and obtain evidence to respond to that risk. And finally, the third objective, and really kind of the end all, is we have to appropriately respond to that risk and make any required communications to those charged with governance, management employees, or potentially regulatory agencies. So now I want to dive into a couple of the requirements uh, during a financial statement audit uh, relative to fraud. And the first one is maintaining professional skepticism. Uh, this is a favorite term of external auditors, and really, uh, I think about this, and when I do training for my, my teams, I think about telling somebody to put their auditor hat on and just maintain a, a heightened level of skepticism. Not that you have to question everything, but you maintain uh, an idea that something could be going wrong. And this is actually a required technique or tool within SAS 99, um, and it's relative to every audit that we work on, regardless of if I've been doing the audit for 10 or 15 years, I have to continue to maintain professional skepticism. Uh, just because I have pleasant experiences with a client and we always try to do that, uh, I have to kind of maintain that independence and question the items that uh, are presented to me. The second uh, requirement is the engagement team brainstorming session. Again, this is explicitly written into the audit guidance that we have to hold a meeting and discuss how and where the financial statements might be materially misstated due to fraud. It's kind of a, an interesting conversation to have as part of a, an audit engagement, is thinking about what could go wrong. We ask a lot of what if questions, uh, what if the controller uh, was taking money, how would they do it? And really forces the external auditor to think about ways that material misstatements of fraud could occur. During this meeting, we have to have the partner present. Uh, it's one of the requirements that the significant members of the engagement team all participate in this conversation. So it, it can't be something that's kind of done on the fly. It has to be a very orchestrated effort to have this brainstorming session. Again, we have to ignore the beliefs and honesty and, and integrity of the client. We have to kind of set that aside and think about the uh, what, could go, what could go wrong uh, situation. One of the requirements during this session is discuss management override of controls, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The third requirement is that the auditor has to perform inquiries of management and others relative to fraud during the audit engagement. Uh, we are required to talk with management, internal auditors if there are any, those charged with governance, so somebody from the board of directors, the general partner, perhaps a significant shareholder, and we have to ask whether or not they're aware of any actual, alleged, or suspected fraud. So as you can imagine, those conversations can get kind of, kind of tricky, uh, but they are uh, a great resource for identifying potential areas where fraud could exist. I love asking the question, if you were going to commit fraud, how would you do it? And that often leads to some spirited discussions about uh, controls and processes and kind of helps focus the audit on those areas where fraud could occur and could result in a material misstatement of the financial statements. Finally, we have to assess fraud risk. And I mentioned this earlier. 
Uh, and we do this through the procedures that I just talked about, but also through uh, additional procedures around analytics. Uh, in SAS 99, the fraud standard requires that we look at uh, analytics relative to revenue, in addition to the other items that we've talked about. Now, it's important to note that this is an assessment of fraud risk and not a conclusion of fraud risk. So we're not concluding that there's a risk of fraud or we're not, we're, we're not concluding that a fraud has occurred, but we're simply assessing the risk that fraud potentially could occur that is material to the financial statements. Continuing on the requirements of, uh, of considering fraud during the financial statement audit is responding to that fraud, with, fraud risk. And I've talked about the inquiries a little bit. And one of the ways that we, we handle the inquiries, and you, you need to do that as part of the audit, is to step outside of the accounting department. If you look back uh, 10, 15 years, auditors traditionally would go to a company, perform the audit, and stay 100% within the accounting and finance department. Well, SAS 99 requires that you step outside of that finance department and possibly interview and uh, perform procedures with people in production, possibly warehousing if it's a manufacturing facility, maybe program managers. And what that really does is incorporates an element of unpredictability into the audit. Again, SAS 99 requires a unpredictability element to be incorporated into every audit. So we cannot perform the exact same procedures year over year, and ultimately the client would come to expect the amount of samples that we would ask for. So we have to think about unpredictability and design our procedures to respond to the fraud risk. Responding to the fraud risk uh, can take many shapes and forms and can, can include test of controls or substantive procedures. Uh, things like obtaining more audit evidence than what you would typically get during an engagement, uh, including amounts from third parties, possibly using computer uh, audit-aided techniques to gather more extensive evidence, uh, inquiring of people that you normally will not talk to, increasing sample sizes, performing more detailed analytic procedures are all ways that we respond to a fraud risk. Management override of controls is the next bullet point on this slide and is, again, something that is required that we have to assess and consider during a financial statement audit. Um, and, and thinking about this, management override of controls can always occur. There's always the potential for somebody to take the controls and processes that are established and override them. So we have to think about how that can occur. The easiest way to think about that is journal entries. Um, there's Journal entries follow a defined process, typically, of approval uh, and posting. That, that often can be circumvented, and because of that, we're required to test a certain sample of, of journal entries during each financial statement audit. Uh, that testing um, involves looking at how the process of performing journal entries is done, looking at the uh, procedures for approval, and ultimately comes down to professional judgment regarding the amount of testing to be performed. Each client's different and involves many different factors. We have to evaluate the audit evidence that we've obtained, including any misstatements that might be identified for potential indicators of fraud. So as, going th as we go through a financial statement audit, we might come across a journal entry that might need to be recorded to accurately state perhaps an inventory balance. We need to consider whether that misstatement is an indicator of a potential fraud and respond to that appropriately. And the final requirement of part of a uh, of fraud in a financial statement audit is communication. I mentioned this before, but any time that we become aware of an allegation of fraud or have a uh, strong suspicion that fraud may have occurred or actually have come across documentation to support that there was something that happened, we're required to communicate that to management immediately. Now, I've harped on the, the fact that we're looking for material misstatements of fraud, but the standards, and, and that is actually absolutely correct, but the standards indicate that any time that fraud comes up in our, in our audit, whether we think it's suspected or alleged or actual, that needs to be communicated immediately to management and potentially those charged with governance. Again, those charged with governance being the board of directors, the shareholders, or the general partner. As I conclude my review of the consideration of fraud in a financial statement audit, I thought it would be helpful to kind of go through a common example that I, I encounter frequently on the audits that I work in, work on, and th that being the unauthorized disbursements. Um, 
normally, this is common to many businesses, often due to the lack of segregation of duties. Uh, there's always a wish to have more and more people in an accounting department to provide additional controls, and because of financial resources and constraints, that always isn't the case. Um, so this is a, a common fraud risk that I've identified on, on a number of my engagements that I work on and then appropriately respond to. An example of something uh, of an unauthorized disbursement is when a bookkeeper is writing checks to themselves or is in collusion with somebody else within the payroll department to uh, take um, assets, being cash, that are of the company's possession to uh, personal use. If I determine that substantive tests of cash uh, may not be sufficient to respond to the fraud risk, that is by testing the bank statement and testing the cash balances at the end of the year, uh, might not be uh, sufficient to respond to the fraud risk, I have to do something else. And what I would normally do is look at the controls over the disbursement process. I walk through and understand how the controls occur and how they are occurring and making sure that they are designed appropriately. Again, as I mentioned, segregation of duties uh, and effective management oversight are those controls that I'm typically looking for, something like an owner or manager who reviews bank statements or disbursements. Again, if that's not happening, I have to, again, go one step further and design some specific responses to this fraud risk. So some examples of what I could do in this situation, uh, I could perform more extended analytical procedures on expense accounts. I could look at year-over-year -year changes in certain expense accounts that might be an indicator for a fraud to occur. I could review selected disbursements for unusual pays, amounts, signatures, endorsements, uh, to see if anything kind of sticks out in my mind as being unusual or odd and, and question that amount. Again, financial statement auditors are not legal experts when it comes to fraud, so it's very important to note that I'm not making a legal determination that fraud may or may not have occurred. I'm going to simply review these documents and come up with an assessment of fraud risk and communicate that to the appropriate levels of management or those charged with governance. I could review vendor lists for any unusual items. If it's related to payroll, I could spend some more time testing payroll expenses, payroll registers, and ultimately perhaps performing a proof of cash, which is a very detailed process of proving out cash, uh, all cash receipts and all cash disbursements. Uh, finally, depending on how that, uh, that testing goes, I would make my required communications with management or if I deem management to be involved in some type of fraud or uh, irregularity, I would communicate that to the owner directly. All right, that concludes my portion of discussing the consideration of fraud in a financial statement audit. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dave Hammerberg, who's going to discuss an actual fraud engagement and fraud investigations. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction to what a financial audit covers. Before we get into skimming and how auditors oftentimes miss skimming or oftentimes it's impossible to catch skimming in an audit, I want to go over what a fraud engagement or investigation covers. First off, no two engagements are ever, fraud engagements are ever the same. Depending on how the audit occur, or the fraud occurred, whether that was in payroll, accounts receivable, inventory, the investigation will start and surround where the irregularities were found and then from there will branch out. Usually the evidence found in a fraud engagement will guide the rest of the engagement. The report that is generated from a fraud engagement investigation covers the evidence and findings that was found in the engagement and is not, um, there's not a, a specific format or wording um, like, a, like a financial statement report. Now that we've covered what a financial statement audit and a fraud engagement or investigation cover, let's jump into what the definition of skimming is. Skimming is, as you can read here in a very wordy Wikipedia definition, taking cash off the top of a daily receipts of a business. That's simply what it is. It's a taking of cash before it is recorded, posted. Next couple slides will go into some skimming facts. These are opinions that I've generated over the last 12 years of 
doing fraud engagements, probably not necessarily the uh, opinion of Macaulay and Asbury, but opinions of just my experience. Uh, the first point, uh, skimming frauds, in my opinion, are never meant to be discovered or paid back. The fraudster oftentimes stealing $10, $20, $30 at a time from a cash register, um, majority of the time they don't know how much they've stolen. So generally I would, I would feel that they would, would not pay that back. M majority of other kinds of frauds, fraudsters, when you're interviewing them, they meant to pay it back. You know, they took the money, they needed it for medical bills, uh, you know, drugs, something that, you know, they thought they would eventually pay it back and never get caught. This is, a skimming is a type of fraud that you take the money and no records have to be, no records have to be adjusted or hidden to cover the f fraud because nothing was posted or recorded. I feel skimming is a is a is a gate, gateway fr fraud. Like a gateway drug, I think it leads to bigger and better. Uh, gate, uh, skimming usually starts out a dollar here, five dollars here, ten dollars here. Maybe at a cash register, an ice cream parlor, or a, you know, a pizza place, somewhere that doesn't get noticeable uh, or noticed. Um, but once you get that money, you know you want bigger and better, and it develops into other kinds of frauds. Continuing on with the skimming facts, it's hard to detect. It's probably the hardest fraud to detect because of no recording. It's the most common fraud in a cash business, and I would say it ranges between a few dollars to thousands of dollars, um, if not more. The skimming can be done by employees, but oftentimes it can also be done by the employer. Um, the last bullet there, if a business owner fails to ring up a transaction and pockets the cash, the crime becomes tax evasion. So um, the, it's not necessarily employee or that teenager collecting the money. It may be you know, John Doe who owns the business who just doesn't want to pay tax on it. So it's, it's a skimming fraud as well as, as, as tax evasion at that point in time. In addition to the IRS, skimming um, may also be done to hide from business partners or shareholders. The partners that are actually running the business may not, you know, they may think they're entitled to more of the profits than they, you know, the, the partnership agreement states. So they'll skim money off the top so, you know, they don't have to share um, according to the agreement. Another example of skimming would be government officials uh, skimming off the top for like foreign aid, something like that. So there's, there's various types of skimming. A few examples of skimming are the following bullet points. We'll go through each one uh, individually. Each one of these are familiar to me because it was part of a fraud engagement or fraud investigation in the past. Uh, some of these happened several times, um, other ones I've just seen once. Starting out uh, with the first one, the school store, the money was collected by the students and then it was then collected by a treasurer or a teacher or someone in charge and the money never made it to the uh, bank uh, for the deposit. One thing we can learn here is the longer it, there is time between the collection and the deposit, the more chance and the more likelihood that there will be money missing by the time it gets there. The other issue with this was it was a school store and the quicker it is posted or quicker the cash is recorded, the less likelihood there's going to be fraud. In a school store, uh, the recording may be done on a piece of paper um, and isn't recorded in a way that can't be changed easily. So that's an example of skimming. Um, in one instance, it was the treasurer. The other instance, it was an office manager that was uh, skimming the money off the top. Second one is an ice cream parlor. 
uh, yogurt stand, whatever you want to call it. The, these were teenagers and they were there for after school um, work, summer work, and what would happen is they would just wouldn't ring up any, you know, any ice cream, any yogurt. It's hard to tell how much ice cream is in a container of ice cream. So it's hard to know that, you know, one ice cream, you know, you, you can relatively know but if you're still ten, twenty, thirty dollars, it's going to be hard to tell. Um, so that was another instance that uh, they would take the money, not record it, um, and and go on their way. We talk about the video cameras a lot. In this instance, it, it would really take care of the issue. The last example of skimming would be a bar. I've seen this a couple times, and if there's not any kind of controls over a bar, employees are going to skim money off the top. I think that's just a, uh, in my opinion, a fact. What happens is the uh, patron or the customer will give cash for drinks and tip, etc., cetera, um, and it just doesn't make it to the cash register. In this instance, controls like measuring devices, cameras, etc., need to be in place, but um, those are the three examples of skimming. The next slide, uh, how to detect skimming. There's various ways to detect skimming. Uh, depending on how the skimming, um, there may be several more than the three I've listed here. But in my experience, company hotlines often detect, uh, help detect fraud. Uh, employer, employees usually are in the know if someone's stealing. And most places will have an honest employee and that will help um, detect the fraud. Surveillance cameras, they're always useful, uh, right above cash registers, by inventory, um, anywhere where uh, something can be stolen, back door, et cetera. The third option there is comparisons and trending. Uh, going month to month on your cash receipts, week to week, daily receipts. If, if every day you receive between $800 and $1,500 of cash, and then every Tuesday you receive $600, is that because it's Tuesday and the, you know there's a specific reason, it snowed, there's weather, inclement weather? Uh, why is that? Or is it because Sally's always at the cash register on Tuesdays? So the comparison helps, um, and it's a fairly cheap way of of, of detecting skimming. Going into how to prevent skimming, for one thing is properly training your employees on the procedures and policies in place for collecting cash, recording cash, um, and how specifically that area works. The second way is a company hotline. If, if someone knows that they could be told on they're less likely to do the fraud, in my opinion. Surveillance, just like in detecting a fraud, I believe it prevents a fraud. Camera systems can, and oftentimes, are an expensive addition, especially if you're adding a recording system and, and then you get into how long do you keep the recording, etc. Oftentimes, if, if that whole system can't be introduced, Cameras with just red lights blinking will oftentimes prevent a, a fraud just because the employee believes he's being watched. That's enough to make them responsible. Unfortunately, that's, that's all it takes to make them be responsible enough to um, not, not skim any cash out of the cash register, etc. Job rotation. Job rotation will definitely help with preventing skimming. They're not going to get comfortable in their position, um, and this will help also with the detection of skimming because if, if job rotation is happening, uh, the comparisons should be um, – you should have good comparisons. And if there aren't good comparisons, the job rotation, you'll find the employees that, you know, maybe the till is – $400 less each week because Joe is doing doing that job for that week. So I think that helps preventing. And segregation of duties pretty much goes along with the, the job rotation. 
um, teaching employees uh, more than one job function and not always collecting cash at, at one time. Sometimes that's not available in like an ice cream parlor. Everyone's got to do skip or everyone's got to scoop ice cream and collect cash. But um, the more you can do that, the, the, the better you're able to prevent, I believe, some skimming in your organization. My last slide in this section just goes over my observations. Uh, money, cash, is vulnerable to fraud whenever it is handled by employees, and I probably should add there uh, employers. Tax on receipts can occur at any point in the business cycle. Two major areas are where the sales or cash are made and where the receipts are collected. Businesses need proper controls in order to prevent skimming. Oftentimes, I'll find skimming in um, when, when the trust between the employer and the employee is too high. A lot of times, it will be a relative or an employee that's been there for 15 years. You know, they trust them. They've babysat their kids. They've, you know, they really trust them. And, you know, th th they would be shocked if they stole money. So they don't put any controls. They don't do any comparisons. Um, that's when we see the skimming occur. That section pretty much covers the skimming that my title to this webinar suggests, which is the skimming the auditors miss. I also want to jump into another type of skimming that is oftentimes the skimming that you'll hear through the media outlets. Um, and that, that type of skimming is credit card fraud. It's the most significant problem facing the credit card industry, and it can happen anywhere a credit card is accepted. Best way for consumers to protect themselves from skimming is by paying attention to the details of their credit card usage. Continuing on with credit card fraud, I want to get into what is credit card fraud and, and, or credit, skimming of credit card. That is when your credit card information, account number, um, your, the, the strip on the back of the card is stolen from you or copied from you, and that could happen in a restaurant, wherever you bring your card, and is used to make purchases by another individual, usually a, you know, um, it could be a, a waitress, waiter, um, someone at the, um, supermarket, you know, just wherever you use your card, um, it could be stolen. And again, just to reiterate, you know, the best way to protect yourself is to look at the details of your credit card usage. Usually consumers will have, um, will not be held for those charges that are made um, in a fraudulent matter. Now, if you're a business, you should check on that because a lot of times a business account, you will be held liable for those fraudulent charges unless you have some sort of insurance. Continuing on to specific examples, I've got three listed here in this slide. A store employee completes a valid sale and then captures a second unauthorized swipe convertly on a portable device. A lot of times, and the most common times, is for, for some kind of swiping device. An employee could write down the numbers and th the information that way, um, but more times than not, it's used by a secondary device. Second example, and this is the one that oftentimes um, we'll see in media outlets, is a skimming device that is added to an ATM gas pump, something that looks like a normal uh, swiping device that belongs to that machine, like the gas pump, but it takes your information, you know, it, it, or it might be added that it gathers your information before you actually make that payment. Um, usually what happens is it'll collect that information, store it in that device there, and then the fraudster will come back later and pick up that device and get the information. A lot of times with that device, there'll be a camera placed as well in that location if a second identification, um, second PIN number or something to identify you, it, it needs to be captured as like a PIN number with an ATM. 
The next slide goes over an example of an actual credit card skimming scheme. And this happened in Lake Forest, Illinois. Um, and it is a relatively new, new case. What happened was someone installed a skimming device, like I suggested in the last slide, um, over an ATM and it was used to steal private information from bank customers. Um, and this was back in February 2013. Uh, police said the device likely was attached to the ATM in the lobby. Uh, it recorded customers' account numbers, PIN numbers, and it was there for two or three months. So the device had to look pretty good, and it had to work that the customer didn't think the machine was malfunctioning. So that device was probably put in front of the slot to put your card in, and it read it, and it also um, allowed the bank to perform its normal bank function through that machine. Uh, police thought, police discovered that this was happening, um, but too late. As you can see in that last point, the device was removed before the banks could have recovered it, which is uh, fairly amazing that um, a device could be there that long, but also very scary. In this next example, we have a credit card scheme that happened at McDonald's. Would you like some fraud with that? When you're buying your, your burger and fries, you're not oftentimes thinking that your credit card information is going to be stolen. In this example of a McDonald's in Oklahoma, 300 cards from customers was information was stolen and used by the perpetrators to buy iPads and laptops. And in this instance, a person went to the McDonald's employees and sort of made a deal with them in order to, for them to swipe the cards, they would get something in return. So that's an, another example. And some of these examples, it's just almost impossible for the consumer to know your card's been compromised until you watch your detail report. Oftentimes, I'll go online and look at my credit card information on a weekly basis, and that may be a, a, a smart move for, for anyone these days. You may be thinking at this point in time, why are we talking about credit card skimming? Is that really, how does that affect my business? You know, we're, we're here for how does skimming affect my business and why auditors can't find it. So let's get into the fact, into why and how it can affect your business. If those employees at McDonald's are doing that, that skimming of those credit cards, are those customers likely going to go back to that McDonald's? It may never happen again, and there may be, may be put, controls put in place so it never happens again, and the controls will probably be better than ever. But the reputation is always going to be there for those people and they're going to tell that story to their friends and and it's always going to be that McDonald's over there. They don't know what they're doing. So that can affect your business. And then on top of that, you have some legal action that is possible by customers that are affected by uh, the loss of their personal information. Next slide, how to prevent credit card fraud skimming for your business. Some of these you'll see are the same as prevention for the normal skimming of cash. Um, the skimming of credit card information, the first bullet point, surveillance cameras at each cash register. This will possibly prevent, help prevent, but oftentimes that credit card, like in a restaurant, you know, you pay with credit card, they take it at your table. There's a long walk between your table and that cash register or that station where they're processing that credit card. The devices these days are so small it could fit in the apron of a waitress or a waiter and that, you know, can be swiped. No one wants cameras watching them eat. So surveillance cameras may not be the the best fit at every business, but in for a, uh, going back to a previous example, an ice cream shop, you know, no one's going to have any quorum about a camera watching over that whole area. So it, re it really depends on the business. 
And again, if you can't afford the cameras, dummy cameras at each cash register would often fix an issue of an employee that, you know, if they're set on taking money, they're going to take it. But if it's not easy access, you know, it's going to, it's going to prevent the, the situation from occurring. Again, trading for employees um, will also be, be helpful. Um, a little fear of God um, always helps, you know, telling them that, you know, prosecution of all fraud will happen uh, to the full ex extent of the law. Um, just to, to know that will oftentimes help prevent the skimming. And the last thing that we've already mentioned uh, several times is a fraud hotline. And the note at the bottom, the fraud is difficult to stop if employees are determined to profit from the information they have to, a to have access to. Oftentimes with these credit card skimming, and it's useful to know this, is people will benefit from, benefit from these credit cards not because they're going to be using them, but because they're going to be selling them online. There are numerous sites online, um, and I don't suggest you go in there because they're full of malware as well, but you can sell these $5 a credit card um, number, and they instantly get cash. Um, so just knowing that and the availability of that quick cash for credit card numbers shows you that this scheme could be fairly popular. Now that we've jumped back and forth between business and being just a normal average Joe, how can you, we'll, we'll jump back into being the average Joe. How can you prevent or detect credit card fraud skimming for yourself? First of all, you want to ensure as, as much as possible that your credit card is swiped only once at a register. How do you do that? You kind of watch where your credit card is going. Now, I know that's impossible. A lot of restaurants will take your credit card. It's gone for five minutes. It comes back. With that, you want to review online in a weekly, daily manner any charges to your credit card. Once you find charges that are inaccurate, you want to contact your credit card company and have them investigate that as well as get you a new card. Second option with ATM skimming or any kind of place where, you know, like at a gas station where you have to enter a PIN number, you want to kind of shield your body over that PIN number while you're putting it in because in order for that fraudster to gain access to your money or your credit card or debit card that's going to produce money for them, they need to have the PIN number. An account, a debit card without a PIN number is useless. What you want to do when you're at um, any location where you have to put in secondary information, uh, ATM, gas station, you want to hover your body over that PIN area because the perpetrator or the fraudster is going to have to have that PIN number. So there's going to have to be a camera, something to capture that information. If your body's in front of that, obviously they're not going to get that information. It's just a wise thing to do. The, other, uh, the third thing there is to subscribe to a service. There are a lot of services out there. Um, I know here at McCauley and Asbury, a lot of people use LifeLock. It will uh, um, allow you to receive alerts whenever there's hits on your credit. Uh, it's useful. Uh, they come with a guarantee. Um, it's, it, it's highly recommended. And then at the bottom, review your credit card statements. Review them weekly, I would say, at the least online. Um, it would be a good recommended. Now, like I said before, credit cards are uh, usually a consumer will not lose out. The credit card company will um, take that off your account. That being said, there are a statute of limitations on most um, transactions. So if you wait too long, now a statement's not going to be too long, 30 days, whatnot. But if you go back um, to past transactions and you never noticed, when I say past ta transactions, I'm talking months, years uh, in the past, it's going to be harder to recover those funds. Well, I hope everybody found this webinar to be exciting and informative. 
this is Jim, and I have Dave here, and we're going to answer some of the questions that came in during the webinar. Uh, thank you again for submitting questions, and if you have any last-minute ones, please go ahead and send those in to us. But we do have a couple to answer that were sent in during the, the webinar. Uh, the first question that came in is, uh, Dave, I think this is actually directed towards you, uh, and it was about skimming. And is skimming usually discovered on its own and usually a fraud that occurs by itself? That's a good question, Jim. Uh, oftentimes, we'll find skimming after we uh, are investigating another type of fraud, whether that's uh, check clapping, etc. cetera. Um, we'll find that, that um, skimming has occurred. Oftentimes, we cannot uh, come up with a, a total dollar amount. We can do comparables, et cetera, from year to year or month to month to kind of figure out what should have been. But it's, again, hard to prove uh, skimming. But yes, we do usually. Um, find that um, with another fraud, and, and that probably is the way the fraud started at one point. And then the fraudster um, came to a point where they wanted more money, got a little bit more comfortable with the controls, they weren't caught, and they had the opportunity to continue. I think during your presentation you mentioned that skimming was a gateway fraud, and I think that's a perfect example that it's a start to probably a more elaborate scheme in other, other areas of concern. I would agree. Uh, another question that came in, Dave, I noticed on your, uh, your information that you started with the webinar that you're a CFE. What is a CFE and what does that mean? A uh, CFE means um, they're individuals who have, um, have accreditation from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. It means that um, they have a little bit uh, more expertise in the detection and prevention of fraud. They've taken numerous classes, additional training, um, pass some tests, et cetera. Um, so those individuals would be the individuals you brought, would bring in for uh, prevention or after the fact the fraud's found, you'd call them up as a third party, bring them in so that they could uh, report on the fraud for prosecution and uh, insurance reasons. I know from my perspective, during a financial statement audit, if, if we uncover or suspect that something is wrong, something might not be correct, uh, normally our financial statement auditors do not have that expertise and we call upon somebody like Dave to come in who has that designation, who's been specifically trained in the areas of fraud prevention and detection uh, to help and assist the team out. Okay, another question that came in, um, I'm going to paraphrase this one a little bit, it has to do with online retail sales. Um, the question states that uh, an individual was with somebody recently who received a text message from an online realtor subsequent to an online purchase. Is this a standard practice that's done to help prevent uh, fraudulent online transactions? This is not something that I have come across. Dave, I don't know if you have any comments or questions about this. I, I haven't come across it, um, but I do have a comment. Unlike uh, a lot of times banks will have controls over and you'll have a second form of authentication or um, you'll have a, a little fob with a key number on it so that you not only use your password but you have the fob um, so it has you know dual authentication. Um, this I have trouble with because when you're doing the order I would, I would think you could put in any phone number and that phone number, whatever phone number you put in the order would then get the text message for you to approve. I'm not sure that and maybe I'm, I'm incorrect here, um, but I, I don't think by putting a credit card in that, that is associated with any phone number in the system. So I'm not sure how good of a control that would be. Good. As a reminder, if you do have any last minute questions, please go ahead and submit those via the question feature in the webinar software. We have a few more that have come in. Um, this one uh, is kind of interesting, Dave. Uh, it says, I've heard that signing the back of my credit card will prevent skimming. Um, I don't know if I've heard of this as well, but uh, I know from my personal practice, I do not sign the back of my credit cards. Is this, uh, is this a way to prevent skimming? Usually, um, if you don't sign the back of a, a credit card, when you go to a um, store or whatnot, they're supposed to ask you for verification. And that, that will um, help, but you know, most of the time they don't ask. So I'm not sure how much it helps. Um, from that standpoint, but from the skimming of credit cards, I don't think it helps at all because most of the times these are mass theft of credit cards, whether that's at an ATM or a restaurant, and they're just taking the numbers. So then they're selling those overseas or to other individuals that don't necessarily need your credit card uh, signature. So I'm not sure how much of a um, 
uh, advantage it is to sign or not sign in the regards to the mass skimming of, of cards. I would, I would tend to agree with you. I think, if anything, it makes me feel important in having somebody look at my ID every time I use a credit card in a store. Uh, at least it uh, has a little bit of reassurance there. Correct, yeah, and, I, and to add to that, I, I think when you're skimming credit cards, you're not going to Lowe's and using them. Now, if you're a teenager who stole the card, et cetera, uh, you may do that, but we're talking more sophisticated online purchases where they're purchasing stuff and they're sending it to other individuals who they then pay to forward overseas, and it's, uh, you know, it's an elaborate scheme. Uh, we're not talking about, um, you know, uh, John Doe going to Pizza Hut and using the credit card. Good question that just came in uh, says, if I suspected a fraud, what should I do? Well, I think it, that's a very uh, very interesting question because there's a lot of different answers that, that uh, can be given here, and it really depends on the circumstances that um, are around your specific situation. I, I guess from my perspective during a financial statement audit, I would try to gather um, uh, as much evidence and information as I possibly could and bring in somebody like Dave uh, to help me look at that. Uh, if I am part of a company and I suspect that there's a fraud occurring at my company, I think the hardest part is probably figuring out who's involved. And I, that sometimes can be a problem in and of itself in that you don't want to tip off the person who's committing the fraud and, and uh, give them an opportunity to cover their tracks. I don't know, Dave, if you have any comments or thoughts. I would agree with that. Uh, big, big question is how much was stolen. And a lot of times you don't know at first. Um, sometimes you have an inkling. And the amount of fraud is really going to... Um, question whether you use an insurance company, whether you prosecute, you know, do you want this to um, go out and be, you know, for your customers to know that a fraud occurred? All those are, are questions. And then the, the other thing you have to consider is, you know, if you, uh, you know, $15,000 is stolen, um, are you going to, then you have to make a decision, are you going to prosecute um, insurance? And if you do, you're going to have to get a third party CFE mm -hmm. in there or someone, and then it's going to cost you money. So if you've got a fifteen thousand dollar fraud, you know, it's going to cost a good amount of money to detect and to report on that fraud. So there's a lot of questions when it when when fraud occurs. Yeah, I know from my my perspective, from a financial statement, I harped on during my presentation that it has to be a material risk of financial statement fraud, and uh, Dave, you kind of reiterated that for us as well. And looks like one final question has come in, and uh, it has to do with what types of businesses usually have skimming occur. Uh, are there examples? Dave, I, you actually had, I think, a slide of this in your presentation, and you talked about some common examples. I, I had some examples in there. I think any, um, any business that takes in cash would be susceptible to uh, skimming. I think smaller businesses like um, that have cash registers, that don't have a ton of controls that maybe are not chain stores would be have more of a, a chance for skimming. Saying that, I think anyone who receives cash has a has a possibility. Yeah, I like to think of it too, not necessarily from a business perspective, but you think about clubs and organizations where there's just a lot of cash involved, and uh, you have volunteers who who mean well, but you never know what somebody's personal circumstances could be and how that cash could help benefit their their lives personally. Uh, so sports clubs. Uh, PTOs, those type of organizations, I think, also are, are pretty high on the list. I would agree with that. I mean, I think with, with skimming, your, and Jim, you're, you're, you're talking about the employee. I mean, I think you also have to look at the owner, you know, in, in small business in regards to skimming off the top, uh, tax evasion, et cetera. So there's, there's different aspects that come Yeah, I would play. think under you know, determining that an owner is skimming would be very difficult to do. Uh, in a small business, it would be. Um, a lot of times I know our firm will go in and try to help businesses kind of work themselves out of bankruptcy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'll come across, you know, boy, the company's doing bad, but the, the you know, the, the owner always has a lot of cash. You know, it's, it's sort <laughs> of, you know, just things like that make you second guess. I got you. Well, I think those are all the questions. Let me just double check here. Yep, those are all the questions that have come in. I'd like to thank the audience again for their participation and active listening during this webinar. Dave, I'd like to thank you for being here and discussing skimming. Um, any last comments or, or words from you? No, I think that uh, does it. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you once again for joining us for this presentation produced by McConley and Asbury, Certified Public Accountants. We hope that you join us and participate in some of our upcoming events. 
You can stay up to date with all of our news and learn about the upcoming events by visiting us online at www.macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.